Today we're going to be looking at, in the book of Luke, it's our lesson number 63. We've been going through the chronological gospels. We began this at the beginning of last year, kind of meshing together the gospels. And Luke takes a lot of these, some of them um, unique to Luke only, some of them, and we'll pick up this old Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Matthew, and I'll tell you where it's at. Matthew places it a little later in the timeline, um, right before Jesus entered into Jerusalem. We do know in Luke's timeline here that Jesus is making his way to Jerusalem. He is not three days out, as we'll look at today, but he is and has his eyes fixed towards Jerusalem. But we have a few things that Luke gives us that Matthew, Mark, or John do not give. So we're kind of hanging out in Luke's gospel right now. And today we're going to be beginning in Luke 13, verse 31, and we'll go down to Luke 14, verse 14. And in this passage, as it was last week, we have Jesus doing uh, a healing work on the Sabbath day. Now, in the Gospels, we have several occasions where Jesus healed people on the Sabbath day, such as an unclean, a man with an unclean spirit, and we find this in Mark chapter 1, verse 21, Luke 4, verse 1, a man with a withered hand, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all speak about this man, a man with a 38-year infirmity, John 5, 1 through 15 tells us of that, a man who is born blind, unique to John's gospel, John chapter 9, verses 1 through 14. We looked at this one last week, a woman who had an 18-year infirmity, and that was in Luke 13, 10 through 17. And now a man with droopsy, we'll look at what that word actually means, but it'll be in Luke 14, 1 through 6. In every case, Jesus healing on the Sabbath, the enemies were condemning him for healing people on the Sabbath day, and there'll be another condemnation towards Jesus today. But we're all going to see, also going to see today about Jesus' Sabbath day healings and his lament over Jerusalem, as we find in Luke 13, 31 through 35. And in Luke 14, 1 through 6, we learn of Jesus' compassion toward this sick man that had been sick with droopsy, but then 7 through 14, he gives the parable of the uninvited guests. It gives me the idea, this man that Jesus healed appeared at this Pharisee's house, a religious ruler's house, but was not perhaps invited to the house. And what do you do with the un uninvited guests? Jesus is going to talk about that. Let's go ahead and get into our first point, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And we're going to look at, first of all, a fox named Herod. Luke 13, verses 31 through 33, the Word of God tells us, On that very same day, some Pharisees came, saying to Jesus, Get out and depart from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And Jesus said to them, Go tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons, I perform cures today, and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. Nevertheless, I must journey today, tomorrow, and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem. So we begin with some of the Pharisees attempting to get Jesus to deflect his mission. They knew that his eyes were fixed towards Jerusalem, that he was heading towards Jerusalem. They realized that there was some kind of purpose. They didn't totally understand Christ. They didn't believe that he was the Christ. But there were many who did believe that Jesus Christ was indeed the Messiah. And they were following him, and a great multitude were uh, coming alongside Christ. So the Pharisees, the religious rulers, they were jealous of Jesus. And they tried to get Jesus to flee his mission saying that Herod was wanting to seek him. Now, Herod Antipas is who's being referred to here. We know in the Bible there are many Herods mentioned. Herod the Great is the first one that we meet that was there at the time of Christ when he was uh, birthed. But 
died prior to him growing up as a young boy and uh, into his adulthood. But from historically, from 6 BC to 39 AD, they record that Herod Antipas, also known as the Tetrarch, because he ruled over a quarter of his father's empire, ruled over in Jerusalem. He is known historically as being sly, ambitious, and luxurious. And in Luke 23, 7, we learn that Jesus was actually from Herod's jurisdiction. And this is the same Herod that had John the Baptist put into prison and ultimately put to death. In Luke 3, 19 and 20, it tells us in Herod the Tetrarch, being rebuked by John the Baptist concerning Herodias, his wife, Actually, it says Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, also added this above all, that he shut John up in prison. Now that tells us about him being thrown into prison. Ultimately, the word tells us that he had John put to death. Toward the end of Jesus' year of popularity, Luke tells us in chapter 9, verses 7 and 9, that King Herod sought to see Jesus. He was curious about Jesus. In fact, he was perplexed by him. And this was because some were saying that Jesus was John the Baptist resurrected from the dead. Others were saying that he was Elijah, which scripture prophesies will come before the second coming of Jesus Christ, Malachi 4, 5, and 6. Others were proclaiming that Jesus was one of the other Old Testament prophets who had resurrected from the dead. So, Herod was perplexed. He was curious about Jesus. But Jesus, he wasn't curious about Herod. In fact, his words, you go tell that fox. Now, in our culture, you call someone a fox, you think of their cleverness. In biblical times, it seems to refer to perhaps their status in society but this is what I believe it refers to, and this is also in biblical times, of someone who has destructive or deceptive qualities. That seems to be the category that Jesus is putting Herod in, and it fits Herod perfect. Someone who had destructive or deceptive qualities. Jesus goes on to talk about being perfected on the third day, and he ultimately appoints to his death, burial, and resurrection. But I don't think here in the timeline, Jesus is actually saying that in three days I'm going to be dead because he hasn't even entered into Jerusalem yet. And so we know that there has to be the triumphal entry and then that there'll be that week of ministry while he's there before he's put on the cross. Once he's put on the cross, he dies. He's buried and three days later, he's resurrected again. So this doesn't fit that timeline. That's still coming. But he does use that word of being perfected. In the Greek, it's teleo, teleo um, When Jesus cried out on the cross in John 19, 30, they used a form of that word, teleo to telestai, when he said, it is finished. And so that Greek word, teleo means to be complete, to accomplish or to finish. And in Hebrews 2.10, it tells us that Jesus Christ was made perfect, teleo. He was made perfect through suffering. And so when Jesus talks about his being perfected on the third day, it is pointing to his death. His opponents, the Pharisees, wanted to scare Jesus into inactivity. And yet, as he journeyed to Jerusalem, Jesus continued to teach to cast out demons, to heal the sick, they were not going to slow him down. In fact, he had said, go tell that fox, behold, I cast out demons. I perform cures today, tomorrow, and on the third day, I shall be perfected. You're not going to stop me. You're not going to cause me to flee from my mission. In fact, John 4.34, Jesus says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Jesus was going to finish the work that God had sent him to do. 
But as Jerusalem was being mentioned, he cried out, 34 and 35, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you are not willing. See, your house is left desolate to you. And as surely I say to you, you shall not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So mentioning that a prophet cannot die outside of Jerusalem in 1333, Jesus then laments over Jerusalem, whose people had a tremendous advantage. They had great opportunity with the temple of God in the midst of the city of Jerusalem, the temple of God at the heart of the city. But they often failed to live up to the high calling that God had placed upon them. Many of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the chief priests, a.k.a. the religious rulers, they did not truly know Yahweh. And here we learn, you who kill the prophets, Jesus at one point condemned them, and we'll look at it in a moment from Matthew, it's like your fathers killed the prophets and you guys build memorials to the prophets that your fathers killed. It's kind of weird, isn't it? It was your forefathers who did this. Matthew 23, 29 through 31. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Therefore, you are witnesses against yourself that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. And they would even take it one step further. They would murder the Son of God himself. And yet Jesus extended his love toward them. Though Israel had never lived up or often did not live up to that high calling that God had placed upon their nation with such tremendous opportunity, giving them the word of God, giving them the temple of God where they could worship the God who created the heavens and the earth. Though Israel often did not live up to that, Jesus extended his love toward them. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. It just reminded me of uh, being in Hawaii this spring. My son lives in Hawaii, so um, it is a travel destination for Lily and I because we not only have a son there, a daughter-in-law, but a granddaughter. And uh, we don't get to see our family too often, so we try to get out there annually uh, when we can. And, uh, you know, with the whole pandemic stuff, we didn't get to travel as much as we'd like to and get to go see them. And so we finally got to go after not being able to see them for a while. And we took Nathan and we went up into what they call in uh, the island of Kauai, the mini Grand Canyon. It's a beautiful area that is kind of like a day trip that you go on. And from where my son lives, and uh, we were staying at the south side, so not too far from the south side where we were staying. My son is on the east side of the island, but it's, you know, about an hour to an hour and a half to get into the canyon, then you drive up to the top, and you go all the way to the top, and you can look over the coast, and you see the Nepali coast, uh, where you can't drive a car, because they'll never build a road there. It's not buildable. And so there's like this stretch of coastline that you can kayak into when the sea's not too rough, or you can hike into when they allow it. But you can look at it, and you're high enough in the mountains that you may or may not get to be able to see it because the clouds could roll in. It's like, yep, I see it. Nope, I don't see it. And you can wait around and hope that the clouds will roll away. It's beautiful when you're there. So we went up. We did all that. We packed our lunch. We came down. There's a ranger station and a little place to eat food. And we had packed our lunch. So um, on Kauai, 
in 1992, this is the legend behind it. There was a hurricane that hit the island. That's not a legend, that's true. And they said that the hurricane uh, opened up somebody's uh, chickens that they were keeping in their backyard. There are chickens everywhere on the island. So people stop at this ranger station to eat and they have signs everywhere, don't feed the chickens. And we pulled out our packs and suddenly we had like 50 of them following us. <laughs> and we went, let's go all the way across over to a picnic table and, um, and they were following us. I mean, they just, the whole thing, come on gang, let's go, they got food, let's go. And they, it was hilarious because they all came running after. Everybody else in the parking lot was fine while we were out there trying to picnic there. But there was a mother hen that was defending her young and uh, two roosters going after them. And she was furious, defending her young. Jesus said, like a mother hen, it just reminded me of that long story of seeing it happen, but it was so hilarious. And I did feed them just to get them out of our way for a little while because they wouldn't leave us alone. So I'd toss something over and they'd all run to it. But they were back, they'd come back, they're smart. They know where the food was coming from. So your house will be less desolate. This seems to point to the coming judgment by God through Rome in AD 70 that God had already judged through the Babylonians in Jeremiah 12, 7, for I've forsaken my, forsaken my house, I've left my heritage, I've given the dearly beloved of my soul into the hands of their enemy. God did this with the Babylonian captivity and he would soon do it with the Romans even though at that time Israel was under Rome and their authority, they still had the temple, but things were brewing at this time. I had read once that while uh, Herod the Great did a remodel on the temple, that remodel lasted for over 60 years. And they said in AD 66, when they finished the temple remodel, that there was something like 40,000 unemployed masons and laborers. And so suddenly you got all these guys out of work. That helped feed into, and maybe they finished the remodel um, just prior to that, but that helped feed into uh, some of the turmoil that would take place. By AD 70, Rome would sack Israel, destroy the temple, and yet Jesus said, you will not see me again until you cry out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now they would at the triumphal entry cry this out, but by the end of that week, many who cried out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, would also be crying out, crucify, crucify him. But that passage comes from Psalm 118, verses 25 through 27, gives us a bigger picture of it. It says, save now. So that's the Hebrew word, Hosanna. Hosanna. Save now, I pray, O Lord, O Lord, I pray, send prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, and he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. And by the end of that week, they had bound Jesus to the cross by nails driven into his hands and feet. Yet at his second coming, they will recognize their Savior, Jesus. Israel will recognize Jesus and they will cry out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The word of God tells us in Romans eleven twenty five 25 through 27, that Paul speaking about Israel, he says, I do not desire brethren that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles have come in. So all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion. He will turn ungodly, turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And in our world today, in the church world today, there is a segment of the church that believes in replacement theology saying, the church has replaced the nation of Israel. And even though Paul wrote to the church saying, don't be ignorant about this one thing. 
And the church responds, we're going to be ignorant about this one thing. He called it a mystery. But when the fullness of the time comes in, when the Gentiles have come in, all Israel will be saved. So as we consider Jesus' lament over Jerusalem, if he spoke a similar word to the United States today, maybe it would be like this. Oh, America, America, one who kills your babies and destroys the faith of your children. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. May it be that these words would never be spoken of us, but to this day, Jesus extends his love toward us that we might be saved. So we get into chapter 14. We have this man with droopsy. Edema is what it's known as today. It just means that he has swelling due to fluid in his body. And uh, we read in 1 through 3, Now it happened as he went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath, that they watched him closely. And behold, there was a certain man before him who had droopsy, and Jesus answered and spoke to the lawyers and the Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? I already went over that many times Jesus contended with them about healing on the Sabbath. This is the third Sabbath day healing, or the third time that Jesus is in the house of a Pharisee and ends up contending with Jesus in the Luke's gospel, in Luke 7, Luke 11, and here in Luke 14. And in Luke 6, 7, it says the scribes and Pharisees watched him closely, whether he would heal on the Sabbath that they might find an accusation against them. So this was not a new thing, but Jesus keeps bringing it up and pointing it out that it's not wrong to do good on the Sabbath, but they could not get past their traditions they were watching Jesus because they had learned the nature of Jesus Christ, that he loves to help and to heal people. He loves people. And he always loves to help those who have great need or the greatest need. So all they had to do is on the Sabbath day, if they knew Jesus was around, look around and see who was that person with the greatest need. And they would say in their heart, I bet Jesus is going to try to reach out to that person. Let's watch. Maybe we can trap him. So again, edema, droopsy, swelling because of too much liquid trapped in their body. Now, Jesus is there as a guest in the house on the Sabbath day. Was this man a guest also? Or was he, because of the parable that follows, an uninvited guest? Now, we can't quite answer that question, whether he was invited or not. But we do know that the tradition of the Jews taught that you could not heal on the Sabbath. So you were in trouble if you got injured on the Sabbath day. They could bring comfort, but they couldn't do acts of healing. So if you cut yourself really bad, they could not, they could maybe wrap it up, but to actually wash to put medicine on it, to stitch it up. Well, sorry, that has to wait until sundown. That has to wait until the Sabbath is over. So they made all these lists of rules of the things that they could not do, just really taking and replacing the commandment of God with man-made tradition and doing good on the Sabbath, doing acts of healing on the Sabbath, like setting a bone or giving medicine to the sick had to wait until after the Sabbath. Jesus said in Mark 7, 9, all too well you reject the commandment of God to keep your tradition. So he asked the question, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And they kept silent, verses 4 through 6. And he took and he healed the man and let him go. And then he answered them and said, Which of you, having a donkey or an ox that has fallen into a pit, will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him regarding these things. They were looking for an opportunity to trap Jesus. And Jesus just said, Look at your own hypocrisy. If one of your animals go down, and he pointed out with the lady from last week, the woman who had 
uh, the infirmity for 18 years, that every Sabbath they water their animals, they take care of their animals, the basic needs of their animals. They don't like not feed them, not water them for 24 hours because it's the Sabbath. Or here he points out that if they fall into a pit, they immediately will pull him out. So they would save the lives of their animals, but of their own people, like Jesus pointed out last week with the woman, saying that she is a daughter of Abraham, and yet you would let her suffer another day just because of your tradition. So they were unwilling to answer Jesus. He healed the man, he let them go, and perhaps Jesus let the man go because he wanted to protect him. We do know when Jesus resurrected Lazarus from the dead, in John 12, 10 and 11, the word tells us, but the chief priest plotted to put Lazarus to death also. Because on account of him, many Jews went away and believed in Jesus. So, a miracle. I mean, the resurrection of the dead, that's a big miracle. The resurrection of the dead, of someone who has been in the tomb for four days, even a bigger miracle. And what do they want to do? Let's kill him again. He knows what it's like to die. Let's just kill him again. And so, confronting the hardness of their hearts that they would have compassion over a donkey or an ox, a lamb, a sheep, but not over this man. In Luke 13, 14, he says, there are six days on which men ought to work. And so here's the attitude. Therefore come and be healed on them, but not on the Sabbath day. Last week we learned of the ruler of the synagogue when Jesus healed the woman who had had that infirmity for 18 years, the ruler of the synagogue, he, he wanted to correct and teach the people in the synagogue, look, people, there are six days where you can come and be healed by Jesus, but don't do it on the Sabbath day. It would be like me saying, look, people, there are six days when you can come to faith in Jesus Christ, but please don't do it on a Sunday. We don't want to see people getting saved here on a Sunday. It's like, are you kidding me? Please come on a Sunday, even on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, any day. Let the word, the Lord do a work in your hearts. So many of the religious rulers put tradition before God and his word. They may have kept the letter of the law, but they failed to understand the true intent behind God's law, and that is love. When Jesus was asked about the great commandment in Matthew 22, 35 through 40, a lawyer asked Jesus the question. Jesus answered this lawyer in verse 37 of Matthew 22. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And the second law is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. The true intent behind the law is love. And loving God and loving others are at the heart of the law of God. So Jesus gave a parable in verses 7 through 11, he said, So he told him a parable to those who were invited when he noted how they chose the best places, saying to them, When you are invited by anyone at a wedding feast, do not sit down at the best place, lest one more honorable than you is invited by him. And he who invited you will come to you and say, Give this place to this man, and then you will... Begin with shame to be take the lowest place. And when you are invited, go sit down at the lowest place so that when he who invited you comes may say to you, friend, go up higher. Then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. I tell you, I read those words and I think about now this week, by the way, for the K-12 
Calvary Chapelites among us, Pastor Chuck went to be with the Lord 10 years ago on the 3rd of October. And so a 10 year anniversary of his passing. And uh, I read about this and I think about going to the senior pastors conference out to out in California at Marietta, where sometimes we had up to a thousand pastors and we would go into the uh, dining hall. Uh, the dining hall used to be this. What I learned was an Olympic sized pool that they got rid of the swimming pool and had uh, kitchens underneath and next to it. But um, so they had this big area where the pool used to be and then a room that you could go off to the left as you walked into the place. But Pastor Chuck had his table. He always sat at the front door as you walked in to the right. That was Chuck's table. And it just so happens that one of my good buddies that I went to the school of ministry with, Terry Reynolds, was Pastor Chuck's second at that time. Wherever Chuck went, Terry was sure to follow. <laughs> if you saw Terry, you knew Chuck was somewhere around. And if you saw Chuck, you could look around and find Terry. And uh, one time I was walking in and we would line up for dinner and I was walking in. Terry's like motioned over, come over and sit with us. So he, he sat me at the head table, which was only once, but it was sweet to be called up to the head table. Never would I dare to go sit at the table and not be invited for I'm sure that they would tell me to go find some someplace else to sit was really my custom, which, you know, when a thousand pastors and out here in the Calvary Chapel, no man's land, nomad land out here, not a lot of Calvary chapels. So not a lot of people know us from Illinois. Um, I would often purposely go in and find an empty table and just see what happens. See who comes and sits by me. Sometimes some of the big names would come and sit and uh, I'd have lunch or dinner with one of the bigger names of the Calvary Chapel movement. At other times, it would be people that I would meet and they would be much like myself and we would just develop relationships. So be careful when you're at a big conference, place, dinner. Um, we still, Lily and I practice this to the day. We'll often go at a conference and just sit at an empty table and see what happens. Lord, who are you going to bring us? One of my pastor friends, when he came, and he's with the Lord now, his prayer of going to the conference was, Lord, who can I minister to for you while I'm at the conference? Having that kind of attitude to minister to others. But not with the Pharisees. Jesus watched them. Jesus watched them as they came in. They were choosing the best places. And he said, when you go to a wedding, don't do that. Don't look at the best place. In fact, take a lower seat and maybe you'll be brought up. Maybe you won't be brought up to the best place, but you'll be brought up. And at least there'll be honor in that rather than sitting in what you deem as the best place and then be asked to move to go take another seat for someone else. And this is not just Jesus teaching this Solomon. In Proverbs 25, 6 and 7, said to take the path of humility. Do not exalt yourself in the presence of the king. Do not stand in the place of the great, for it is better that you say to you, come up here. He say to you, come up here. Then you should be put lower in the presence of the prince whom your eyes have seen. So don't jockey for position. Uh, just let it come. God, God will let it happen. Take the path of humility. And apparently all the invited guests were jockeying for position that day, choosing the best seats, wanting that influence, the importance among the circle of influence in their life. And Jesus talked about that in Luke 20, 46. He said, beware of the scribes who desire to go around with long robes, who love greetings in the marketplaces, the best seats in the synagogue. And the best places at feast, Luke 20, 47, who devour widows' houses for a pretense. They make long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. They look good on the outside, but their hearts were rotten. We don't want to be like that. Take the path of humility. 
as Jesus said in this passage, that you take the path of humility, verse 11, whoever exalts himself will be abased, and whoever is humbled will be exalted. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Peter picked up on this in 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another. Be clothed with humility. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due time. And so that is the path of blessing, verses 12 through 14. We'll finish out with these verses today. And so he said to him who invited him, when you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back that you be repaid. When you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. So talking to the host, Jesus said, check your motives when you have a dinner party. Just don't invite your friends, your family, your rich neighbors. Also include those who cannot afford to be there in the sense they don't have the means. They are, as Jesus called them, the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. So normally in our relationships, we are reciprocal. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a given in the Pharisees. I don't blame them for this. Uh, we've been this way. Lily and I have been trapped in one side of relationships before when it seems like you're always the one giving, giving and giving and never receiving, receiving, receiving. We had a prodigal son who was uh, a taker. And uh, it wears on you and it wears you down. We've had other people in our lives that, you know, if you, if you didn't invite them and, and partake with them and bring them over, they would never invite you. So it can wear on you and sometimes it limits. And even some of my own family members, I've kind of limited um, my interaction because I realized that it's always a one-sided relationship and you know, it's not fun being stuck in a one-sided relationship. That's just kind of how it is. But Lily and I have also, especially uh, when we're hosting either at Easter, Thanksgiving, or Christmas, and we know that there's maybe Navy people here. They're often around in our church through the years. Maybe there's a new family or someone that doesn't have family nearby in the area. We will and have often extended invitations to them. I uh, one time we had six, I believe it was six Navy corpsmen that came to our house for Easter one time. It was a blessing to serve them in that way and to be able just to open up our home and to give them a home-cooked meal. And of those six, one of the gals came in um, on the last Sunday that they were here. And Mike, Pastor Mike was a pastor at the church at the time. So this, we were involved, but we were not, I was not the preacher, but uh, one of the gals gave her heart to Jesus on the very last Sunday that she was here. And so our labors paid off for eternity, and that's great. So be open to help. Um, it doesn't mean that we're never to have. I mean, when the pandemic took place, and everybody uh, in government saying, stay in your homes, don't leave, stay in your homes. My wife said, I'm not going to not see my children and my grandkids. And so we started at that time, and this for me is reminiscent of something my mom did and dad, but mostly is my mom's doing for their kids when we were all adults. For us, uh, that started a Sunday night meal. So we have been cooking a Sunday night meal for the kids for the last three plus years, and it's great. They expect it, um, and we plan it and plod what we're going to make and, and the time together with the family. Um, for my mom, it was Saturday morning breakfast, you know, come and have breakfast and then go out about your day. But the house is open for breakfast. And that was a gathering place for myself and my sisters and their families when we were adults. And so it was fun uh, having that. It was memorable having those things. So 
I don't think Jesus is saying don't do things for your family. We should, but be attentive to those who have need. Colossians 3, 23 and 24, whatever you do, do it heartily. As to the Lord, not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. Whatever you do, do it heartedly. In Luke 12, 32 and through 34, it says, Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So we have the kingdom awaiting us. So Jesus here says, Sell what you have. Give alms. Provide for yourselves money bags, which do not grow old, treasures in heaven that do not fail that no thief approaches or moth destroys for where your treasure is there your heart will be also so the path of humility is a path of blessing so jerusalem jerusalem who showed more compassion to one of their animals than they did to a brother or sister in need oh jerusalem jerusalem who jockeyed for position at dinner parties while neglecting the poor, the maimed, the blind, the lame. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who were unwilling to come to the shelters of the arm of Jesus. Have we been guilty of some of these same things? And Father, we thank you for your word that you've given us this day. And as we close out in worship now, Lord, let our hearts be attentive to your spirit. May you move among us. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.